Let's get this. Got it. All right. No. Oh. Good afternoon, and welcome to the first in our series, uh, second actually in our series of Q and A sessions. Today's topic is the Adam Online Ass Assessment Administration System, specifically focusing on questions about rostering and accessibility. Uh, my name is Dwayne Dixon. I'm the moderator and I'm the program manager for the main science assessment at New Meridian. We also have Krista Averill with us, the assessment coordinator from Maine Department of Education and our resident expert in all things Adam that will be responding to the majority of any of your questions will be Bob Wolf, the senior product management analyst at MZD. We also have with us Kate Richard. She's our project manager for the main science assessment at New Meridian, as well as Amanda Doyle, our project coordinator for the main science assessment at New Meridian, uh, fielding questions from the chat. <clears throat> Just a couple of housekeeping tasks before we get to started. Uh, we do ask that you submit your questions via chat. We will be monitoring that throughout the session so that we can pick up your questions quickly and easily without having to worry about trying everyone trying to speak over each other and figure out whose turn it is to speak which is always the fun thing on virtual meetings. Uh, we do ask that you keep your microphone muted unless we ask you to unmute it so that you can ask us a specific question or to clarify a question that you put in the chat. Just a reminder that all of our Q&A sessions are recorded. And so if you have to drop off early or if you have a colleague who wasn't able to make it, you can direct them to watch this and uh, listen to them. So. On our screen right now is the contact information for our support desk, as well as um, we're starting to, of course, see an uptick of contact, contact questions from you guys, which is awesome. Just a reminder that we have three areas on the support website other than the button to submit a ticket. And um, just briefly, we've already talked about it. Here's Krista Averill, her email address from the main Department of Education. We also have a toll-free number as well as our a um, email address, not email address, been a long day, um, website address, <clears throat> and so forth. And then here we have kind of just basic idea of accessibility features that we'll be going through here in a moment. And Krista, at this point, I've pretty much covered all of our basics here and kind of just housekeeping in the very beginning. So I'll kind of hand it over to you to give us a rundown from the DOE perspective. Excellent. Thank you, Dwayne. So as Dwayne said, I'm Krista Averill. I'm the assessment coordinator for both our main science assessment as well as our NWEA assessments. Um, and we can jump right into that slide you were just at, Dwayne, since I'll be going through the accessibility features. So when we're looking at the accessibility features for the main science assessment, we're going to be looking at three tiers of accessibility features, universal tools, designated supports, and accommodations. So universal tools, I'll be going through each of these, but universal tools are available automatically to all students. Designated supports are available based on an individual determination, and accommodations are limited to students with 504 plans or IEPs. So on this slide right now, we're looking at the embedded universal tools. These are the universal tools that are provided automatically to all students within the online assessment platform. And they include review, which shows your flagged items, variety of accessibility features, such as color scheme, font size, and zoom, flagging or bookmarking questions to return to them for review, line reader, and response masking, which is the same as answer eliminator in one of our other assessments. So one of the things that we recommend always is that to have your students become more familiar with these tools is to have them complete a practice test. So they have the opportunity to use the tools before the day of the actual assessment. Next slide, please. A non-embedded universal tool is one that is provided by the proctor in the, ass in the assessment environment. So our non-embedded universal tool is scrap or scratch paper. This does include um, graph paper, line paper, blank paper, individual erasable whiteboards or assistive technology devices. 
And the expectation, of course, is that all scratch paper is collected and securely destroyed at the end of each test session to maintain assessment security. Next slide, please. So next we're going to look at designated supports. So designated supports are determined on an individual basis by an educational team. So for example, but certainly not limited to a multi-tiered system of supports, response to intervention, individual language acquisition plan, and student assistance team. So just clarifying what team means. So those are some examples, but essentially a team is two or more educational professionals with knowledge of a student's performance. That's how we are defining it. And then in addition to being determined by an educational team, those supports provided must be consistent with the student's normal routine during classroom instruction. And these supports do not alter the construct of any test item. In other words, they don't change what is being assessed. They just change a student's ability to access the question itself. Next slide, please. So for our embedded designated support, that would be text-to-speech. So text-to-speech would read the text aloud to the student. That would include all parts of the text, the directions, the questions, the answers, the uh, prompt and reading passages on the side. And so again, text-to-speech is a designated support. There are two things that would determine a need for text-to-speech, an educational team of two or more individuals with knowledge of a student's performance, and it's consistent with their day-to-day -day instruction. Educational teams could be two teachers that work with the student. It could be a teacher and the school assessment coordinator, the teacher and the district assessment coordinator, but essentially we want this decision to be made by more than one individual on their own. Next slide, please. And so there are also several non-embedded designated supports that are provided by the proctor or assessment administrator in the environment and are not part of the platform. So for example, breaks and extended time, the assessment is three 60 minute sessions. So for students who need breaks during that 60 minutes, that is an appropriate designated support. Please be aware that the student should still be provided 60 minutes to complete the session if needed. So adding on the time that was taken by the breaks if it is needed by the student to complete the session. Extended time is also available if the student needs more than 60 minutes per each session. We just ask that the session is started and finished within the same school day. We also have individual and separate setting as well as small group setting. There's also alternate aids and supports. So this is presenting the test through either alternative or assistive technology, and also potentially visual aids and auditory devices. And you can see there the list that gives some examples of those things. And lastly, we have a bilingual word glossary for multilingual learners. So this could be provided at the local level to students who have that as a language support per their individual language acquisition plan. We do re recognize that typically Bilingual word glossaries are provided online or digitally, but students cannot have access to an additional digital online device during the assessment. And so these would need to be provided on paper by the school or SAU. Next slide, please. So read aloud human reader. I'm going to have you go to the next slide. That is not. <laughs> that is not labeled correctly. There you go. So accommodations, read aloud human readers. So that would be if in a student's IEP or 504 plan, it says that text is to be read aloud to them. Just a note on text-to-speech versus human reader. This text-to-speech feature does include um, the alt text for the images, the graphs, and the charts and diagrams. So be aware that text-to-speech would also describe that, whereas a human reader would not be able to do so. American Sign Language is available. Braille is also available. We um, receive our Braille counts from Nancy Moulton at Catholic Charities, and I'm going to be sending out communication to schools who 
we know have students who need Braille next Monday when our other assessment platform opens. So if you don't receive an email from me by end of day on Monday and you have a student who needs Braille, just reach out. And then also Scribe. So for the Scribe accommodation, the proctor administrator will enter the student's answers into the platform. There are constructed response questions on the assessment. So those would need to be entered into the platform. Next slide, please. And then we also have paper-based in large print forms as an accommodation. So this would require that the school or SAU completes a request for a paper-based assessment. That form is both on our website and on our main science support site. And please be aware that for this assessment, paper-based forms are mailed to the school or district, and then they are mailed back to SME, the company that mails them out. Um, I'm mentioning that now because for the main through year assessment, they are print on demand. So I just wanna highlight that difference at this moment. Next slide, please. All right, and I'm gonna hand it back over to Dwayne and Bob. Thank you, Krista. We're now gonna actually move over to Bob and let him take us through a brief stroll of the support desk and then actually then move into a live demo of Ross training and so forth. Um, Bob, it's all yours. All right, well, um, let's go ahead and take a look. This is, you're seeing right now what um, I'm gonna eventually show you. Um, I'm gonna try to grab the screen. You can give me control. And then let's make sure we get the right desktop here. Let me know if you can see my Adam screen right now. Yeah? Okay, great. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time here because uh, you all have seen the support site. Um, I just wanted to point out what we're gonna talk about today is going to be about rostering and that information can be easily found by doing something like typing in roster or uh, typing in student or any word you might wanna think of that has to do with, with rostering, um, typing in SAC, right? So you can use this search. You can also just search for videos and tutorials. Um, and that's really all I want to talk about with that. We'll be turning on some things like the other support later on. For now, you can just create those tickets. Um, I am going to also now log in as a school coordinator. Okay, great. Um, all right, so on our agenda, we want to talk about a few things. We want to talk about accommodations. Um, we'll look at um, how to create accommodations. I want to show you a change that was made in Adam that lets you um, look at uh, preferred names and how those are set. And then finally, we're going to talk about the rostering steps or getting your kids into classes. and um, That'll kind of round up what we want to talk about. So I'm going to start with a new field that was added. So this is all pretend data, um, but I am in as a, um, a school coordinator and I'm in rostering users. And the new field that we added, if I just go into edit now, if I have it turned on, No, let me try again. You know what, before I do that, do you wanna pop up the PowerPoint again? Let's make sure that I'm following things in the correct order.
Okay, great. So this optional preferred name, which I am going to uh, eventually show you here, um, you can see that on the user setup page, which is where I was just at, right underneath the first name and last name is an option for adding preferred name. So this is going to be empty for your users at this point, for your students. But the idea is if you need to make a change to how a student's name shows up, um, and that would be on the, the testing card, or even when we're searching for these students in, um, in Adam, that change can be made here by updating the preferred first name and preferred last name. So again, directly on that user's record, you'll be able to make that change yourself. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm gonna okay, good. So the next thing that I'm going to show you is the accommodation upload. And I'll show you that in Adam. We'll do the next slide. Let me make sure that I'm doing these things in the right order. Okay, next one. Perfect. Okay. So you can throw the um, share screen back to me and we'll go ahead and walk through that. All right, back to looking at our students and going into edit on a student, you'll see preferred name, preferred last name. So this student's name is Aiden McCormick. I'm going to change Aiden's first name to, um, because maybe we spelled it wrong or maybe just goes by a different name. We're gonna call him, um, he actually goes by Dan. So I'm just going to change that preferred first name, save it. We get this user saved. And we'll now see that on this page, Dan, it's changed to Dan McCormick. That was Aiden. Um, and anywhere that we would see Dan or Aiden's name in Adam before, which would include the student test cards, would now be changed to using the preferred name instead of the regular name. And to get rid of that, all you need to do is just remove the, the preferred name, save the record, and now it's back to the way it was before. Right, pretty simple. Just have to um, make that change on the student's record them itself. Bob, we have one question in the chat sure. uh, that was asked: Is the preferred name live? Is it live? I'm like actually um, in Adam right now. <clears throat> it is. Okay. And then there was a second comment that was in their dashboard. Actually, let me take the preferred name. Let's look. It is live now. As soon as you save that page. <laughs> Let's see if I've got, let me make a couple, make, make it up a couple of these changes here. And as fast as that, it is now live. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And that's kind of what I was experiencing when I was trying to do this myself. Um, thank you, so Bob. Everybody says to... thank you. <laughs> yeah, you bet. How about that for uh, sir, customer service quickness? <laughs> yeah, we try. Okay, so now... Um, I want to show you one other thing that you may have already done this before in the past. Um, I am logged in as a school coordinator at this point, and let's just verify that this has changed. Go into a student, edit. There's preferred name. So good. That's what we wanted to see. 
So the other thing that I wanted to show you is with accommodations. And again, you may have done this last year. This isn't new, but it's worth taking a look at this. So um, I'm going to show you two different methods for updating accommodations. I'm going to go into Aiden's record again and edit Aiden. And over here on the left, we'll see accommodations. So it's just fine. I can come in, set accommodations, and you'll notice that in here, some of them are grayed out. Those are accommodations set by the state. It's what Krista was just talking about with the form-based accommodations. And then all the rest of those accommodations and supports are going to be listed in here for you to set those check marks if those are if you've gone through the correct approval for those. So you can do these one at a time. The other option, which is really handy, is I might come in to, again, rostering users. And I can search by or come in here and set this. Um, I don't have any of my classes, so that's actually fine. I might come in. This is only this one school. So I might come in and select all. So now this is all of these, all 27, right? Not that many. But then come up here to this kebab menu and choose student accommodation upload. So this brings me to the student accommodation upload instructions. And so there's three things we want to do. This is describing what you're going to see on the on the on the export or on the template. And some of these are locked. Remember, when we looked at these manually, three of them were grayed out. So those are indicated here as grayed out. And then these are the other accommodations that we actually can set. So I'm going to download the template. This will obviously be a little different if you're using a Mac or if you're using a PC. My downloads come into this system tray here, and I'm able to simply open this, and Excel will open. If you use numbers or if you use sheets, that might be just a little bit different. Let me make this bigger so you all can see this. What comes out then is a list of all of those kids a special ID for them. So this is not their student ID that's in column one. That needs to stay the way that it is. Um, here's the students' names. We can see what grade they're in. We can also see now all of those accommodations. Now they're coded. So this doesn't say text to speech, it says TTS and um, extended time, right? So these are the values that we're able to set. Very simply, all you need to do to change a setting is put a one to say, yes, we want it, or either a zero or nothing removes that particular accommodation. So let's see, I just added to Bernard Southern text to speech. And that's the only change I'm going to make, but you could hand this off to somebody else or give it to their teachers. But all of these students, you could update them at the same time. Again, I just made this one change to Bernard Southern. So I'm going to save this record. And Bob, before you go away, I yep. know you've been showing it, but if you can scroll back up a little bit, you can also bulk change preferred name here as well. That's right. Um, the preferred family name and the preferred given name can be set here and family name being last name. Right, it matches up with, in case you can't remember, because I never can either, come over here and look, this is family name, which is last name, given name, which is first name. Thanks, Twin. So I'm gonna save this. Now, when the way that I save this out of Excel, it's going to automatically resave this back as a CSV, a comma separated um, version of a file. If you're using numbers, numbers acts differently you need to do a file export to uh, a csv format um, there are instructions in the uh in the website um, on zendesk on, on how to do that if you're not familiar with that so again bernard southern we turn text to speech on so there's a csv out there i can now click go down here to step three browse out find that file that i just updated Again, you can see that it's a CSV file, .csv. It's going to update 
all of those records. Now it's not really updating all of them. I only changed one record, but now I can upload. And if we go look for Bernard Southern and accommodations, we'll see that Texas Beach is now turned on for him. All right, so you, it allows you to do a lot of kids at one time. If you want to match this up against your master file or wherever you have those accommodations set, this is how you want to make that change. And do, do we have any qu other questions that came up about that, Dwayne? Myself on mute? No. All right. So accommodations, again, this is documented in, uh, in uh, Zendesk. You can see, I believe there's even a video out there that walks through it. So um, you can take a look through that. All right, well, we're gonna move on now to rostering. Now we've already added all the kids. Um, now we hope we added all the kids. Um, they should all be in there. Um, that's one of the things as a school coordinator, what you kind of check are all of my kids in the system. Um, then what we want you to do is to pay attention to a couple things. One is this number up here, view unrostered users. So I know uh, that I've got 25 kids out here in my school, and right now all 25 are unrostered. Unrostered means that they are not in a class, and we want our kids to be in one and only one class. So this is the process we're going to go through. So you have this number up here, view unrostered users, that's 25, that's too many. I can also come down here to unrostered and say, only show me unrostered. This is also gonna show me all of my kids. And if you look at this column here called classes, all of these kids are not in a class. The easiest way to do this, and when we talk through this process, we're going to use these classes as a way to create our proctor groups. So from our perspective, we're not doing reporting on down to the class level. So when we build these classes, we're really thinking about how do I want to separate these kids into smaller groups for testing? We do this one grade at a time. These are all actually eighth graders in this list, I believe. Um, but we're going to be creating their testing groups. And we just call them classes. Um, this could be classes. It could be some other a designation. So I'm going to go. So again, here's all of my kids. I can look in edit and see that in classes, there's no classes associated with this student. I could come here and manually add kids to classes if I created them that way. It's just not the efficient way to do this. So we're gonna work from a file. I'm gonna start with rostering classes. And I have two classes left out here from last year. You may, I don't think you do. Um, they should be gone. So you should see nothing in here if you're coming from scratch. We're coming up here again to this kebab menu. Click this, quick class upload. This process requires that you do this one grade at a time. These are all eighth graders in my list, but I am gonna still choose eighth grade. The course will populate for you. When you do this, it's not gonna say demo eighth grade science. It'll say eighth grade science or fifth grade or um, whatever grade we're working with. You are gonna to wanna to set academic session. I'll probably, I haven't decided, Choose just use 22, 23 as your academic session. And the school, since you're a school coordinator, should be a single school, your school. If you have multiple schools that you're associated with, you're going to do this one school, one grade at a time. So again, before I do the download, select your grade, select your academic session, select your school. And now we're going to download the template. This is going to download a CSV of students who are not in a class. That's important. I'm going to say that again. Students who are not already in a class. If they've already been, if you've already put them in a class, they won't end up in this download. So 
So this is what my download looks like. Student ID in the first column, the name, first name, last name, course ID, school, court, school ID, academic ID, and last but not least is this column called class code. Please pretend you don't see class code. It does not have to be a class code. This is just what it's called in this file. Class code is going to be the name of the group. The name of the class, maybe. Maybe it's the name of the teacher. But it's ultimately going to be the name of the proctor group. How do I want to separate these this group of eighth graders so that they can be tested? So I'm going to create a class code based on the person who's going to be proctoring them. And we're going to say that this is Jimmy Jones. And I'm also going to have Mary um, Smith is also going to be the other proctor. So again, however you want to do this, if you have want this to actually be teachers' names and the classes that they're in, that's fine. Go off of your roster, your school roster, and put their actual class names in here. Each student can only be in one class. And I've just broken these eighth graders up into the two rooms that I'm going to test them in. Jimmy's going to test proctor one room. Mary's going to proctor another room. Before I go further with this idea, are there any questions that you want to put into chat uh, that we can talk about right now? Okay. I'm going to save this. Again, this is saving this as a CSV file. If you do, if you if all you do is come in and populate this G column and save it, and it's going to create a CSV, you should not have any trouble at all with this. And now watch something happen to me. File saved. I'm going to come back over into Adam and come down to step three, which is where I search for that file that I just created. And if you, I know that this is small. Um, I'm going to try to expand it. It's not going to work. When you do this export, it names it really nicely. It names it with quick class. It also names it with the name of your school and also um, what grade they are and what the date is. So it, if you're doing multiples of these, it's nice that it's labeled so that you know which one you're doing at the time. So I added that in. It's exactly what I expected to happen. It said, you're creating two new classes, right? Jimmy and whoever the other person was, Mary, I think. And all 25 of those kids are being rostered. Don't forget to click on upload, otherwise nothing happens here. So upload, that is also where you could get an error message. If you messed with the formatting, that's where that would happen. So now you'll notice that I have two new classes here, Jimmy Jones class and Mary Smith class. They each have kids in them. That's done. The class was the classes were created. The students were rostered. So if we come back over to users now, there are zero unrostered users which is why I don't see anything. If I take off this show unrostered, it removes that filter. And now I see those 25 kids, except for now, the class column is populated and they're populated to the class that we rostered them into. Quick class upload, it's very easy, very fast. Um, and this is something that if you, when you jump in here, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't remember. Support will be happy to walk you through this. Um, move through that process. Bob, we do have one question. Yeah. Um, Paul here said that when he opens his quick template, I'm presuming that's quick class upload, it says it's blank. So that will happen if your students are already in a class. Um, that I will, I would have to look for sure. So one of the reasons would be if those students are already rostered in a class that quick, quick quick class file, this file, would be empty because this is only going to include 
in this case, my eighth graders in this school who are not already in a class. So that could be the problem. Um, what I'll do, Dwayne, take note of exactly who that was, and I can take a look specifically at their setup and make sure that we have everything configured properly. Will do. Thank you. So the next thing, so bear with me, I'm going to, um, I'm going to log out here and come in as um, someone with a bit more power. Because I want to show you the next thing that you're going to ask me about is going to be administrations. Um, and you noticed, maybe you didn't notice. So let me show you before I, before I fix this. Middle school log in as this person again. All right. So once we get closer to test day, you're going to find that this administration's area is going to be filled with the cards, four cards for each grade. This is going to be empty for now. You don't need to do anything in here. But uh, in a matter of um, once we build these out, you are going to start to see those administration cards. And I wanted to just quickly um, orient you to that. This is what you're going to see now, administrations, nothing there. But let me do something quick here. All right. So now, now that an administration exists, let's log back in. And now when I go to administrations, I'll see that administration card. This is also different this year, uh, slightly different. Um, in how it looks, but we still have students over here on the left hand side. We've got your proctor groups over here on the right. So these are all of the kids in your school that qualify for this particular test. So all of your eighth graders, um, you can see that list of kids. Right? That's just like last year. If I come over here on, um, oh, sorry, here is where you would come in and, and print your cards. This is another one of those places where the, the name will be replaced if you use that replace name. And then Proctor Groups. So based on those classes that we created, this is how our kids are going to be separated. So Mary Smith and Jimmy Jones. And this Proctor Group has half the kids in it. This Proctor Group has the other half. You can see who's in each of those Proctor Groups by clicking on Sessions. And then um, you can actually go into the Proctor dashboard um, from here. Um, your proctors will use the test code and Proctor passwords to log into those Proctor groups when the time comes for them, them to actually proctor this test. Um, what I wanted to point out again in here is I've got these 25 kids, right? Every hour we refresh each of these cards because it's possible that a new student moves into your school between now and then, um, or text-to-speech might get turned on, whatever, whatever is might happening. What's really cool about this particular process is that at any point between now and the time that these tests start, if we add a new user to any of the classes that are eligible for this test, this number is going to be incremented 
by that much. So if I were to add a new user to one of these two classes at the top of the hour, so we're not waiting that long, but at the top of the hour, that new student would just automatically get added into this administration because they are eligible to take the test. Um, a lot of your questions, um, once we get closer to test day, are going to come in in that form. Um, I added a kid yesterday, or I added a kid this morning. How come they're not in the administration card yet? I can't print their cards. Those students will show up every hour um, as these um, administrations refresh. So that is all I wanted to walk you guys through today. Um, are there any questions that have come up, Dwayne, that I can um, that I can answer? The one question we have right now is, can multiple proctors be signed into the same session? That is a, a great question. That answer is yes, they can. Um, any proctor that logs into the, so we call this anonymous proctoring because they don't have to be a, a, an Atom user like you are. Um, but any proctor that logs in to the proctor dashboard, so let me do something here real quick. I'm copying and taking this information. So any proctor that comes into Atom through here, so this is the same page you go to log into. If they come in and do proctor a test, they can enter that test code and proctor password. Multiple proctors can be in there at the same time. In fact, your anonymous proctors, which again, that's just what we call people who log in with the proctor login. If they come in and log in, and then you also log into the, um, to the proctor group, but use your authority to get into the proctor group, um, using, sorry, I'm, I know I'm being a bad host by jumping around here. Um, by using your authority to get into the Proctor group, that's also fine. So come back into Proctor groups, view, and come into here to Proctor. It's fine for you to be in there. It's fine for other people to be in. They'll just use They'll use the anonymous test code proctor passwords. You're going to log in through Adam. We're going to be doing another session um, on proctoring itself. And at that time, we'll talk more about things like creating alias proctor groups and um, which is Actually, maybe I should talk about it quickly now. Even though we have these two proctor groups set up, Mary Smith and Jimmy Jones, it's possible that at some point you say, you know what, I want these kids broken down even more. So not class-based. This is nice because every admin that we have going forward will break these kids into these groups. But maybe just for this administration, I want to break some of these kids apart and break them by... Um, so I'm going to call this the quiet room or makeup room or whatever we want to call it. We can now search for any kids that are Texas Beach, maybe, um, and maybe want to put them in this room. Um, we can also, so yeah, let's do that. Let's grab these kids and I'm just going to mark those three. So now these three students have been added into Quiet Room. It's created a new Proctor group, alias Proctor group, and moved them out of whichever rooms they were in before. Working with this, if I want to create another, if I let's say that Aiden student, if I need to move him into another room, I may just want to come in here and find out where is he now. And so I can actually start typing in his name and it said, oh, he's in the Quiet Room. I might have to come into the quiet room if I don't want him in there anymore. I can come in and edit this alias and simply remove. Now Aiden is out of this group, back to his original group, Jimmy Jones. Bob, we have had one question come in. Good. And it's from a Chris. 
It says, just to confirm, adding accommodations will go into that top of the hour sync, as well as adding users to classes. That's absolutely correct. Yep. So, and uh, timing is, is a, it can be tricky, right? We, we really would prefer that um, you might go through all of your student list one more time the day before testing starts so that it can roll in on its normal schedule of, of every hour. Um, last minute changes, support can do those. You know, that's, of course, it's inconvenient for you to have to wait and, and uh, they're going to be busy with um, maybe working on other kinds of issues, but uh, they can force submit or force move things through to have them go a little faster. Um, our, of course, our preference is try to get those done a little bit more in advance so that it can just flow through naturally. Okay. Thank you for that question, because that one does come up through support quite a bit, too. Oh, yeah, that one does. And um, we have another question here. It says, if we put students in an alias proctor group after test tickets are run, do we need to rerun them because it changes test codes, et cetera? Wow, you guys are full of some good ones. Okay, so um, the students that are in this alias proctor group can still take their tests using their original test codes. So if you want to, I might, um, I might reprint them, but you don't have to. Um, so let me go back to print cards again. And I always like this toggle title pages. This is my favorite one. So this is quiet room test code with these kids in it. Then I also have those two kids. So Bernard and Alicia were originally in one of these two groups. I don't know which one it was anymore, but um, those two kids could still get in using their original test codes. So their original test ca cards will still work. Um, but you could come in if you wanted to and just come in and choose proctor groups and just reprint the quiet room. just your new alias proctor groups if you wanted to do that. So I know I talked a lot, probably too much about that. Um, so no, you don't have to reprint the cards. Should you? Maybe so that they'll match what the proctors got in their room. Um, but you you can get by without printing a new card if you want. I was just going to ask that. If you don't reprint the cards and you have a different proctor for, say, your example, quiet room um, alias, and the students log in with their previous cards, your proctor in that quiet room will not see them in their alias group as staff. No, they'll, they will. They'll, they no. still come into this proctor group. Okay. Okay. Just yeah, so that's all that. good. That, that's fine. That's when that student logs in, they're going to come into this proctor group. It's just when that, that proctor, everything's just not going to match up. When this proctor who's looking on, the, the test codes for those students um, and sees their test card, they might get confused because this proctor is going to want them to put this in and their test card says something else. Yeah. It's it's not a problem, but can that get confusing? Yeah, it could if the proctor's not, if, if we haven't been really clear. Yeah. But the student's fine. The student can log in with either code. So I think that could possibly be a um, on-campus decision as to how well do you know your proctors and how well <laughs> are they at at um, handling um, differences under extremely stressful situations, then that might answer your question as to whether you need to reprint those cards or not. Yeah, the, I mean, the other thing is, um, which you, you mentioned, those accommodations are visible um, on like this proctor view I don't think it shows on their cards, but on this proctor view um, version of of these. So this is another one that you may choose to print these. Or you, you might print these all early, right? But if a change comes in, um, you might miss some information. So but you can come in and print just 
certain pages of these also. To kind of steer us back to where the focus is of our current Q&A session being rostering and accommodations. Um, and knowing that we do have the other session uh, specifically targeted towards proctoring on April 13th, yep. uh, I'd say, are there any other questions um, out there concerning rostering accommodations or anything of that um, manner? We do have one question here. How long does this session run? It runs, if I remember co correctly, till 315, um, or excuse me, 415 <laughs> Eastern. I'm at Central, so 430. <laughs> there you go. 430. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> you rescued me. Thank you. But I reckon we're almost done. I don't feel like there's a ton of questions coming through. So, Dwayne, we do have just that last slide um, that we had discussed about the rostering, if you want to. Pull it up. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Second. As long as, as long as you're opening up the live version, it should be good. Yes. So while Dwayne is pulling this up, I'll just let you know that we're gonna talk about rostering for just a moment because the process that our DOE data team has used has changed slightly. Um, and I'd like you to be aware of those changes before you're looking in your rosters and wondering, why am I seeing these kids? Why am I not seeing these kids? So as you know, the data team submits rosters based on the student information in NEO. This year, students are being rostered at their attending school where they receive their instruction. So that would be, for example, a regional and alternate program, out-of-state schools, special purpose private schools. And so therefore, those are the schools and locations that are going to see these students in their rosters. In the past, they would have been rostered to their responsible SAU. Um, that is a change this year. So Two things. First of all, uh, Maine DOE's assessment team has been actively reaching out to those out of state schools and those special purpose private schools to establish those connections with them, um, help them be prepared for both this assessment and the NWEA assessment. Um, we do recommend, of course, reaching out during the assessment window and just checking how things are going in regards to participation. Because you won't see these students in your assessment roster, it got very dark on my camera. Um, you will, however, be able to run an out of district placement report in NEO. And then you'll be able to see which students the SAU is responsible for, yet are rostered out of district. So I'm just throwing that one out there so you're aware. Um, again, we're actively working with these out of state schools, special purpose private schools, and with a few of the regional programs that have already reached out. Um, to make sure that they're on track for that. This year, you're also going to notice your home instruction students. So if you have a home instruction student who receives 1% to 99% of their education at school, that'd be FTE codes one through four, they will be in your roster for your resident SAU. These students are not required to participate in the science assessment or the reading or math assessment. Um, but they are there because they do spend some of their time in publicly funded instruction. So that is a joint decision between the SAU and the homeschooling family if they would like their students to take the MEAs. But you will see them, so just be aware. And finally, Synergy and NEO remain the source of truth for our student roster information. So if something changes, please update it in Synergy. And then we have a daily change file that will sync that information with what appears in Adam. I think that's everything. Thank you. And I know we get support questions quite often about that. Um, a student's missing on the roster or a student is not showing up or you have a student that um, no longer is in the school there. Um, but to speak to Krista's point there that yeah, the, the synergy in NEO is a source of truth. So if it's not, showing an atom correctly, something may or may not be going correctly with that sink. Yes. And so we don't typically manually make those changes at the state level, because if they're not made in synergy, that daily change file is going to revert it back anyway. So we do ask that all those changes are made in synergy. 
Um, there's a question, what date do the Synergy Neo roster data pools begin? I, the assessment rosters are currently in Neo um, as we speak. <laughs> so they are, they're there for spring 2023. They should be up to date. I can reach out to our data team for clarification on that. But since we are starting or have started the daily change file already, um, if those rosters are not up to date, that's something that we would need to know. And you could either reach out to our MEDMS help desk, or you could just reach out to me. It might be faster on some days. Um, and I can take a look into that. Just another thing to consider for rostering, um, and this will be going out in our next April monthly update to DAX, but just some clarification on who needs to assess and who doesn't need to assess. So fairly often I get requests for removals of exchange students from rosters. Um, that would be the biggest one or privately funded students attending a public school. So if the student attends one of Maine's public schools, a special purpose private school approved by Maine DOE, a regional program, a charter school, or one of our 60-40 private schools with at least 60% publicly funded students, all of those students are expected to participate in the state assessments, um, but not necessarily all groups count towards that school's accountability measure. And that detailed information is going out in our next monthly update. And it's all pulled from our main comprehensive assessment system guidelines, um, which have not changed, but we just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page regarding who's in your rosters, why they're there, and who you are actually held accountable for federal accountability purposes. So for newcomer students, newly arrived English language learners, I'm I'm going to assume that's what that means. So um, our newly arrived students who are multilingual learners can be exempt from the reading assessment, depending on their arrival date. They are not exempt from the math or science assessment. Hey, Krista. Yeah. So I believe that the, so yeah, the daily poll, I think that's going to start tonight. Yeah. If I remember Thursday. Right. <laughs> it yeah. should. All right. I was I was gonna, so gonna because it time. starts tonight, it should, yeah, it should be what you see in Neo and Synergy should be updated. Definitely. If that's not updated, you need to let me know. What you see in Adam should be updated as of tomorrow after the daily change file starts this evening. Yep. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing, Bob. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And barring no issues, everything, if there are any issues, will be cleared up by Monday. But yeah, it should be all changes should be in the system by tomorrow. And Paul, I just double checked your records. Um, your schools are all in classes and rostered. So that's why you couldn't see anything in quick class upload. Way to be ahead of the game. <laughs> I am going to throw my contact information in the chat too. I try to do that at each of these sessions. So if there's a question that comes up after the session, um, please feel free to reach out. I do always call people back. If I'm in a meeting, I can't answer the phone, but I assure you that I do always call you back. So I'll put both my phone number and my email there for anyone who has any questions. And then in addition, all registrants will be receiving the slides from today, the Q&A, and the recording. Um, it'll also be in our main science support site as well. Mm -hmm. I think we're kind of 
near and wrapping up here. Are there any other questions from anyone? And of course, if you think of them later, definitely reach out support side to uh, us or to Krista, and uh, we'll make sure to get any of your questions answered. <laughs>